to get Pastor Max to pick them up. <laughs> I don't have time. Are you that too? <laughs> All right, grab your Bibles and 2 Timothy chapter 1 is my text. We've already read through it, so I'll just uh, get into it. Uh, 2 Timothy and chapter 1. We find Paul here at the end of his life. Uh, he's he's uh, writing his last letter pretty much. We're quite sure that this was the, the one he did last. Uh, famous last words, you might be thinking. But he's clearly not coasting to glory and comfort. He's at the end of his days, but life is hard. Let me just outline to you how hard his days were. He's in chains. He's in prison in Rome. He's suffering for the gospel. He knows that he's never going to be free again. Uh, he's going to die as a martyr. And his personal troubles of suffering as he nears the end are compounded by the actions of others against him. Uh, he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 1, you're aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me. And at the end of the book in chapter 4, he writes about Demas, who in love with the world deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. And he writes in chapter 4, at my first defense, when he was on trial, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. So what do we have then? We have Paul facing death. He's been deserted by his friends. And then to add even more pressure to the Apostle Paul, he knows that there's some dangerous theological error going on in the churches that he has been in. So in chapter 2, he writes about Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection is already happening. Uh, they are upsetting the faith of some. So here he is. He's at the end of his life. He's suffering. He's facing desertion by his friends, his co-workers, and he's seeing the church face theological danger. And it's into that context that Paul writes this letter. And I want you to think about that. In, in that context, maybe if, maybe if it was you writing this letter, what would be on your mind? What would, be, what would you be thinking about if you were tasked with this? What, what letter would you write as a final letter to the church? And Paul, as we read this letter, his overarching thought is this. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. Others may have deserted me, but not the Lord. In chapter 4, he writes, He stood by me. I love that, 2 Timothy 4, 17. He's always been faithful. The Lord, he says in chapter 4, will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. He might not bring me safely through this life, but into the heavenly kingdom, he writes. That's Paul's great final message to the church. In spite of all that I'm going through, in spite of all the suffering I'm facing, all the unknowns, all the hardship, I want you, Timothy and Church of Jesus Christ, to know that God is faithful. He is faithful. And from that wonderful foundation, Paul encourages the church, he encourages Timothy, he encourages the church as well, to be faithful to him. God is faithful. So you be faithful to him. And the whole of 2 Timothy is really a call to the church to be faithful. It's a call to Timothy, but it's a call to the church as well. And you can sum up 2 Timothy in four sections. So yet chapter 1, be faithful in ministry. Chapter 2, be faithful in suffering. End of chapter 2 to the beginning of chapter 4, be faithful in contrast to the false teachers that are around. And then Paul concludes in chapter 4, Paul's uh, personal faithfulness to God. So you know, friends, at the end of his life, with all his troubles, he could have been really inwardly focused. I mean, who, who would blame him? He's in prison. He's chained to the wall. He's had his friends desert him. He's, he's worried about the churches that he has planted. Who would blame him if he was self-focused? But that's not the case. He is concerned with his God who is faithful. He is concerned with the Lord's church, the Lord's kingdom in this world. And Paul's burden is that the gospel, the true faith of the gospel, be passed on, be preserved. Uh, God's faithful. We need to rejoice in him. And uh, he wants the, the gospel to continue in the church. That's Paul's great final call. So, people of God, where are you today? You know, Be faithful. Your God is faithful. 
you be faithful as well to him. Calvin wonderfully notes in his commentary that this call to be faithful to the God who is faithful is not written in ink so much as it's written in Paul's own blood. In calling us to faithfulness, he's asking nothing of us that he's not going to face himself. He's going to lay down his life for this gospel. So figuratively speaking, this is a letter written in Paul's blood. Now, why 2 Timothy? Uh, we know that all scripture is God-breathed. It's relevant at all times. But the more I thought about this book, the more I thought, this is a book for our time right now. This is a book for us, especially relevant to us. When our whole culture seems to be shifting against the gospel, against Christianity, when many evangelicals are deserting the foundations of the faith, when many pastors and great teachers are falling into sin, when the church is plagued by error, this is a letter for us to continue. God is faithful. He is sovereign. He's in control. So you be faithful to him. Even if it costs us, we need to be faithful. So with that in mind, got three points, because preachers always have three points, it seems. First of all, I want you to note here a present hope. A present hope, verses 1 and 2. Paul begins his letter, as he often does, with a description of himself. But he's, he's writing to Timothy. So why would Paul put in there this description of himself? Why well, We don't write like this, Max Randall of Endeavor Christian Gathering, a pastor, we don't write like that, to a, a personal friend, but Paul does. Why? I think one reason is that Paul isn't just writing to Timothy. He knows that although this is a personal letter, it's a letter for the church. And it's a letter, of course, for us as we, many thousand years later, read this letter. He expects it to be read and applied in the church. So how does he describe himself? knowing that the church is going to read this letter, how does he talk about himself? He says, first, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, people bandy that word apostle a lot these days. What's it mean specifically here? He is an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. And he has been set apart by the Lord Jesus to lay down the foundational teachings on which the church would be built. He's, he's writing scripture as he writes this letter. And Paul is saying, because I'm an apostle, I have the authority to lay down how you should live and how you should respond, um, even though the times are the way they are. Paul's saying, I'm writing an authoritative letter. But the authority is not his own. I mean, he goes on, he says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He's saying, I have been set apart. This is God's will. By God's will, I've been set apart to do this. I haven't taken on this task by myself. I haven't simply decided, well, I want this authority, and I'm going to teach the church of Jesus Christ. You know, people in Africa these days and in India and places like that are all saying, well, we're apostles, or we're prophets, and they're taking on themselves this authority. Paul says, no, no, this is God's will in my life. And Paul is saying, too, that, all my life, even the hard times, it's by the will of God. I'm under God's will, his leading, his guiding, his directing, not just in the good times, but in the hard times as well. And I think, you know, Paul is saying to us here too, and to Timothy, Timothy and us, whether I'm free or whether I'm in chains, I'm rejoicing because God's in control. Whether I'm suffering um, I don't look so much at my circumstances because God is reigning over all and he is my authority. All of this is according to his will. So Paul's an apostle. He's an apostle by God's will. And in verse 1, 2, he's living according to the promise of life that's in Christ Jesus. It's an interesting phrase because Paul is facing death. He's isolated. He's concerned about the church, but he identifies himself with the life that he has in Christ Jesus. For all his horrible circumstances, he knows that his promised life is sure. He knows that he is united unbreakably to Christ. And this is the message he takes to the world. He, he's suffering, but he's believing in his heart uh, God's promises to him. 
So you may ask, you know, who's the author of this letter? It's written by an apostle who, who wrote this scripture, who lays down the foundation of the church. But before any of that, he was a sincere believer who rejoiced to what God had done for him in Christ. He's a believer in God's promises. Um, that's our only hope as well, right? Our only hope in life and death is the Lord Jesus Christ. So who then is this letter for? Who's it addressed to? Who are the recipients? Well, in one sense, it's the church universal, yes. But in another sense, it's a very personal letter. So verse 2. To Timothy, my beloved child. It's quite touching, I think, quite amazing to imagine the Apostle Paul chained as he was, alone, isolated, facing martyrdom, and his thoughts go to this younger man that he discipled, that he worked along, alongside for so long. Uh, Paul once said in, in Philippians 2, he says, I have no one like Timothy. He has proven worth. He's a son. Um, he served me in the gospel. What, what a great blessing it is to have gospel partnerships, gospel friendships like Paul and Timothy have. What a great blessing to have those that we can depend upon, those we can think of when we are in our times of need. Now, there wasn't any biological connection here. He calls him a son, but he's a spiritual son. And this is much more deeper than a natural connection. And so at the time of his greatest distress, Paul's thoughts go to Timothy, his beloved spiritual son. He's writing to somebody he loves dearly. Now, what is his first message to Timothy? Look at verse 2. It's a hope-filled prayer. Grace Mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Grace, unmerited favor. We deserve the opposite. And he gives us this favor, this gift of salvation apart from works. Mercy, that rich forgiveness of our sins. It's free. And peace, that holistic, you know, it covers your whole life sense of God's love and favor. And Paul says to Timothy, and he says to us, these things, grace and mercy and peace, are yours in Christ Jesus. Present tense. Because you know God as your Father, so grace and mercy and peace are yours. And I think we need to remind ourselves of this regularly. What do you need in life? I'll tell you what you need more than anything else in this world. You need God's grace and God's mercy and God's peace in your life. More than anything else, that's what you need. And if you're a believer, that's what you have in him. You've been given grace and mercy and peace because you're joined to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul begins this way, in essence, saying, whatever your circumstances are, you might be in prison, you might be suffering, you might be sick, whatever you're going through, whether you are free or in, ch in chains, no one can take this away from you. Grace, God's grace. His mercy, his peace, it's yours. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. And you know, we can get so easily caught up in our circumstances. Believe me, I, I'm right there with you. We can so easily get caught up in our circumstances, the things that come and go in our lives. And they can dominate our thoughts. We close our eyes at night and that's what we're thinking about all the time. But what Paul is saying here is, Fix your mind on the things that are yours in Christ Jesus that can never change. They will never fade away. Anchor yourself to this, the grace and mercy and peace in Christ. And then whatever you go through, you can handle it. God might not take it away, that suffering you're going through, but he will give you grace and mercy and peace in your life. And I'm preaching to myself here, if we lived... If I lived more in light of those blessings, boy, that would change everything. In light of the fact that God's been so gracious to us and merciful, he's given us peace. And that's our present hope. He begins with that. Second point, the past remembered. He looks back to the past in verses 3 through 5. Now, it's natural when we come to the end of something to start reminiscing. Do you remember that old 70s song, song reminiscing, Little River Band? reminiscing. As we get to the end of something, we start to think about, you know, how the past was and how things went, and we, we think about certain things in connection with our life. And so in verse 3, Paul reminisces. He remembers his own past life. 
He says, I've lived a life of gospel service. The God whom I serve, verse 3. And he remembers that he has lived faithfully according to God's covenant promises to Abraham, as did my ancestors, Paul is saying, when I took the gospel into the world. I wasn't betraying the faith of Abraham. As we've been learning, this is what Abraham's faith was pointing to. I was truly living it out. And then Paul remembers that he's lived with a clear conscience, verse 3. Now he's not saying he doesn't remember sins, because if you remember the first letter to Timothy, back in chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of, of whom I am chief. I'm the chief of sinners, Paul says. So he's not saying that he's never sinned, but what he is saying is, as I look back, here, here I am at the end of my life with the peace I have in Christ, and I've lived a life that sincerely strived for God's glory. I've done my best. I haven't slacked off in my ministry. I have a clear conscience. In Acts 24, 16, I live as one who always takes pains to have a clear conscience toward God and man. So he remembers his life and he says, I thank God I served him with a clear conscience. And verse 3, I thank God, he says, as I remember you, Timothy, constantly in my prayers night and day. I, I prayed for you all the time. I'm not sure what any of you are hoping for when you come to that point where you're looking back on your life. It might be soon, it might be far away, but a life of serving God, a life of faithfulness to his word, a life with, which brings a clear conscience, a life of prayer for others. I really can't think of a better way to, to end your life and to reflect on the things before. So Paul remembers his own life. But then in verse 4, he remembers Timothy's life. So verse 4, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I might be filled with joy. And these tears that, that Paul talks about here were probably Timothy's when Paul and Timothy were last together and they said their goodbyes. And, and theirs was a close relationship, like I've said, like a father and a son. And the parting would have been very sad, like in Ephesians 20... Ephesians 20, I think it is as well, where he says goodbye to the Ephesian church. So Paul remembers their last goodbye, and he longs to be able to be with his spiritual son once more. I long to see you, Paul says, that I might be filled with joy. And that's just a reminder that we don't live our Christian lives as individuals alone. We don't. If you are a Christian, you live your Christian life in community with other Christians. We are not lone rangers. Uh, we live our Christian lives in relationship with each other. And that's how we grow in relationship with each other. And when we're apart, you know, I like my holidays. <clears throat> I, I enjoy my holidays. But I tell you, when we're apart, even though I'm enjoying my holiday, I miss you guys. And when we are apart, it's, it's hard. And when we're together, there is joy and there is blessing. I know I've told you the story before about John Fawcett. Uh, but Fawcett was born in England in the 1700s, and he was saved under the, under the preaching of George Whitfield, a very famous preacher. And uh, he was saved when he was 16 years old, and soon after he began preaching, as they did in those days. In 1765, he was called to a small, poor, country gospel church, a Baptist church, in Waynesgate, Yorkshire. And it was a simple church filled with very simple people. They were farmers and shepherds and so on, and they could barely support John Fawcett and his family. Um, he was there for seven years when he got the call from a large church in London. And you can picture this, a very big church in London, a church that had had John Gill, Dr. John Gill as the pastor for 50 years, and Gill had just died. So Fawcett would be following John Gill in this large, influential London church, and it would have been a step up. They would have been able to pay the bills and, and feed their family and so on. So he preached his farewell sermon at Wayne's Gate. And the day of their departure came and his family's belongings were all packed onto the wagon or whatever they used back in those days. And they're sitting up there in the, in the carriage and everybody's crying. The church is crying. Uh, his wife and kids are crying. He's crying. His wife turns to him and she says something like, John, I don't know how we can go. And John Fawcett replied, 
nor can I. We can't leave. And they, they didn't leave. They got back off the carriage and unpacked their stuff and stayed at Wayne's Gate. That's when he sat down and wrote that hymn that we'll sing in just a moment. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. The rest of the story is that church in London, uh, two pastors on had Charles Spurgeon as their pastor. The pastor that followed Gill right then wrote a hymn book. He put together a hymn book and he included that hymn in his hymn book as Fawcett stayed at Wayne's Gate. Now, uh, certainly, some bonds that Christian has with, have with each, with each other are, are stronger than others. Um, that's life. You know, the Lord Jesus had three special disciples out of his 12, but the main point is that Christians need fellowship. They need a church. They need a people to, to develop and to invest in. And you're, you're not going to have that kind of joy, that kind of blessing, if you just turn up to church every now and then. There is a commitment and investment necessary in each other. And that leads then to great joy and blessing. That's why during the COVID years, I think they were so hard on us and other churches as well, because we were not able to fellowship and to chat and to invest in each other as we should. And I'm afraid that's kind of affected us even today where you know I still sense a reluctance to, to get together, maybe a laziness an inclination to avoid the sacrifice and the effort needed to be here. Uh, it's much easier to stay home and stick to ourselves. It's so much easier to rush out of church on a Sunday, but to find that joy, that, that blessing, takes hard work in each other. These things are difficult. So, so Paul remembers the tears when he and Timothy said their goodbyes, and he wants to have his fellowship one last time. He remembers his own life. He remembers Timothy's life. And uh, verse 5, he remembers God's faithfulness to Timothy. Timothy had a Gentile father, but he had a grandmother and a mother, Lois and Eunice, who were Jewish believers. Timothy had grown up being taught uh, the Bible, the Old Testament, I suppose, by these faithful women in his life. And now he's come to own that faith personally. Isn't God wonderful? Isn't God great? Isn't he faithful and blessed? Paul remembers this blessing in Timothy's life. Let me, let me focus a minute just on the young people here this morning, and in particular young people who've had the privilege, and it is a privilege, of growing up in the church under maybe, maybe Christian parents and so on. Maybe you don't think it's a blessing, but it is a blessing. It really, really is. Have you responded to... You know, personally to these things. Have you responded like Timothy did? It's one thing to grow up under godly parents, uh, to love the Lord and follow him. It's, it's one thing to be taught about Jesus, but it's quite another thing to respond to it yourself. You ever heard that expression, God has no grandchildren? You know, I've heard that a few times lately. You know, certainly God has children. He has sons and daughters in Christ who have come to him, but, but no one is a Christian by, by virtue of their parents, uh, their, their parents' faith. You have to come to Christ yourself. You need a personal relationship with him. And, and young people, if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are greatly blessed. You are in God's family. That's cause for great joy. Here's Paul. He's, he's able to remember Timothy's life. I'm reminded of your sincere faith. I know it dwells in you. You, you. Your mother and your grandmother, they believed in the Lord. It's, it's now on you. What a great blessing it is. And Paul's able to see Timothy's sincere faith. So young people, if that's you, if you've grown up in the church, it's got to be your faith. You, you, you know, otherwise, you'll turn 18, 19, you get yourself a car, and you're gone because your faith isn't real. And so at the end of his days, Paul reminisces over his own life. He reminisces over Timothy's life. He remembers God's faithfulness in Timothy's upbringing. And these are all great things to think about. At the end of your life, he's facing death, and he's ending well, like the Methodists of old. They died well, it used to be said. Well, friends at ECG, live your life so that at the end of your life, you die well. 
and your final thoughts may be on the same subjects as the Apostle Paul. So a present hope, grace, mercy, and peace to us. And then we see Paul remembering the past. Finally, note the ongoing privilege, the ongoing even into the future privilege that we have to serve him. Verses 6 and 7. We can never stand still in our Christian lives. We're either going forwards or we're going backwards. And so Paul, having praised Timothy for his real faith, his sincere faith, which was visible to all, he urges Timothy to press on, to keep going, to, to fight the good fight. Now, it's important to see Paul's logic here. The, the logic of the Bible is never work hard to become what you are not. That's never the logic. The logic is work hard because of who you are, because of who you are, or better, work hard because of what the Lord Jesus has done for you. You think of the Ten Commandments, and there's an a intro to the Ten Commandments. How do they start? I am the Lord God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I am the God who redeemed you. I am the God who has saved you, who has done great things for you. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. And that's the pattern in the Bible, in the New Testament as well, that, that what we do flows on from who we are. And so Paul is saying here, Timothy, Timothy, on account of who you are, on account that you are a sincere man of faith, on, on account that the grace and mercy and peace of God rest on you, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame, I like that, that picture, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Timothy, you are a saved man. You are a gifted man. You have been set apart for ministry because of who you are, fan into flame. I can picture you know, kneeling down by the sparks and you're, you're blowing on it, you're fanning into flame that spark. So, so keep using your gift. Work at your service. Grow. Don't sit back and rest on your laurels, but continue to serve God deeper and in more meaningful ways. Now, the specific gift that Paul's talking about here um, is probably the gift of preaching. I think it's a word gift, the gift of, of leading church, of preaching, of teaching, and it was something God had given to Timothy. It was confirmed by prophecy back in 1 Timothy chapter 4. In other words, God gave this gift, and they laid hands on him and confirmed it, and set him apart, ordained him for ministry. And so Paul is saying, you've been given this gift, You've been given this job, this task, now fan it into flame and develop it. I think sometimes we, we, we dwell too much on the idea that our gifts must be some kind of a talent that, that we have that God's given. But I think sometimes our gifts are opportunities. Sometimes there are things that we don't feel comfortable doing, but we, we do them because God's placed us here. And he's given us this opportunity to serve him. So, so Paul's saying, you've been given this. Now, don't shrink back. Don't slow down. God's given this task to you. You've been set apart for this work. Fan into flame this gift. And I think the main point applies to all of us. You say, well, I'm not a, I'm a pastor. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a church worker. The main point here is that for every one of us, God has given opportunities and tasks and things to be doing and things to be faithful in. 1 Corinthians 12, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. You know, varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You have something here today to serve for the common good of the church. Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Fan in the flame whatever God's giving you to serve him. Don't shrink back. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. What a great encouragement that verse is. We can be sure that our gifts will be fanned in the flame and will grow. God can use us because of verse 7. He's given us the Spirit, and I don't think it's just Spirit smallness. I think this is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. He's given us His Spirit 
And we've been indwelt by him to serve him. We are not alone in this. So again, verse 7, how does he do it? Well, the Holy Spirit removes fear. And he gives power. And he gives love. And the Holy Spirit gives self-control. It's pretty easy for us to come up with a list of things that might stop us from being faithful to God and not serving him. It's not hard to come up with that list. And I think high up on that list would be fear. I can't do this. I can't do this because of what might happen to me. Maybe I fear not having enough energy or strength to do these things. Maybe it's easier just backing off and sitting in the chair. Maybe I fear looking foolish. Maybe I fear what that person thinks or what that person thinks. Weakness would be high on the list. You know, I can't serve the Lord because I don't have the strength. But God's Spirit gives power, not our own, but His. A lack of love would be high up on that list. For many people, many Christians, I just can't be bothered helping other people. I've got my own life to live. I've got my own responsibilities. I just don't feel compelled, compassionate, whatever. My heart is too cold, but God's given us His Spirit of love. And self-control. Nothing that, help, that you know, prevents us from using our gifts. We haven't been self-controlled. Maybe we've been angry with somebody. Maybe we've gossiped about someone. And so when the chance comes, because we haven't been self-controlled, we can't really serve them. We can't bless them with our gifts. And what Paul is saying to Timothy is, I understand fear. I've been there. I understand weakness. I understand lovelessness. I understand lack of self-control. But remember, you have the Holy Spirit. And so when you are fanning your gifts into flame, you are not doing it alone. You have the Spirit within you. And he's casting out fear. And he's working love in you. And he's working self-control. And he's giving you power to serve him. Timothy, church at ECG, Paul says, fan your gifts into flame with the confidence that the Spirit who has given you these gifts and these opportunities is working in you to help you use them for his glory and for the good of his people. And when we leave this place in just a few minutes, let's do so reminded that the Holy Spirit is in us as believers. He's working in us. May God be with us as we do that. May we be reminded of God's blessing in our lives, that, that mercy and that grace and that peace. May we be reminded of the past blessings of God in our lives. He's brought you this far by his grace. And be reminded of what he has for you in the future as you serve him wholeheartedly. God is faithful. We are blessed. We are a people of faith because we have the Holy Spirit with us. May God help us. I want to sing that hymn.